Let me ask you to turn into the Bible and uh, into the book of Philippians in the fourth chapter. We're going to be in Philippians 4 every Wednesday night in the month of November. Uh, just really going to be in the same setting, Philippians chapter 4. So, uh, Ben, let's go back to that original screen. The power of peace of mind. Well, would that be wonderful, Mike? Would that be wonderful? Not a piece of your mind, okay? <laughs> all right, right? You've all been you've all been a recipient of a piece of somebody's mind before, right? Let me give you a piece of my mind. But, but having peace of mind, this peace of mind. You know, we just don't have to be bothered or burdened by something. Something that's turning over in the back of your mind all of the time. You know, I don't, I'm not a technical person, but, you know, on these things, you know, these cell phones, you know, it's like a computer screen. There's always something running in the background. You have to, you know, just like sometimes I'll get Darlene's phone and she's not in here yet. But she was like, I'm not trying on my phone. I'm like, oh my goodness, you have like 59 things still open. And it slows it all down. And I'm like, that's my mind too. Your mind too. There's like 60 things running around here all the time on the home screen. And everything's getting slowed down because it's bringing it down. Because you got all this stuff working around right now. Even when you're talking about something else, if you pause for a second, you go, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got that thing still working. And then when you try to say, okay, you know, that's it, I'm going to bed, and you go up the hall, and you make your way to the bedroom, do whatever it is you got to do, then you're ready to just let it go. And there it comes. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're trying to let it go, but here it comes. And you don't have peace of mind there either. And so it's a struggle for a peace of mind. So the Apostle Paul, the entire book of Philippians, is a letter written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church of believers, Christians, at the place called Philippi. So we call it Philippians. And so it was written, but now I think it's important for us to realize the circumstances that Paul, where he was and what was going on in his life when he wrote this. He was not on vacay in the Caribbean or somewhere. Hey, he was not, you know, just, you know, chilling on the beach. Hey, guys, hope you're doing well. Had you on my mind today. Thought I'd check on you. Life's great here, getting a tan, I'm in the sand, you know, it's hot, but not too hot, it's cool, but not too cool, everything's just right. No. Paul is actually, in A.D. 62, in the dungeon of Marmotine Prison in Rome, Italy. So, prisons are kind of bad places to be, anytime. Roman prisons are really bad. Roman prisons in 62 AD are extremely bad. So where he's located is less than ideal. He's in prison for preaching the gospel, waiting trial before Nero, the, the Caesar, the emperor. And he's writing out letters and he's sending out correspondence to churches and to people. Last Sunday, we were looking in 2 Timothy, and I'll probably reference that again a little later. But he was writing to Timothy then, and he's getting out letters, come to me quickly before, you know, they take my life. Come before women. And he's, this time he's writing out a letter, he's scribbling out a letter, and he's writing it to the Philippians. And so in this adverse circumstance, of being in prison for doing a good thing, preaching Christ, in a horrible and deplorable situation, he talks to us about having peace of mind. 
And the whole book of Philippians is about joy. And you can have joy despite the circumstances that you're in. Because the circumstances do not dictate joy. Now, the circumstances has a direct effect upon your happiness, but not your joy. For your joy is on the inside. And it's not to be hampered or dampened by what's happening on the outside. So let's just get a look at one verse tonight. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Hmm. The power of peace of mind. The cares of life can make us powerless. We can focus on problems, and when we're focusing on those problems, it can certainly dampen and weaken our faith. The cares of the world can drain us of the potential of our minds. So many times we're found uh, idolizing something or some chasing or in pursuit of something or some way or some happening or desiring something that we're focused on that thing and not on the things of God or the things of Christ. Our cares can keep us from expecting the return of Christ and from robbing us of the potential of what our minds are to be on. And I think Paul is, a, I know Paul is a human just like you and I are. And so he experienced some of those same struggles and some of those same temptations that you and I do about what do we think about, where does our mind go, the cares of the world and the worries of the world and the worries of this problem and that problem and all of these things were taxing on him too. But he found peace in a prison because of his relationship. Christ. And he says there in chapter 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing. Nothing. But pray about what? Everything. Anxious for nothing. Pray about everything. Now, I think about that. I'm like, God, you know, do you, do you really, really want us to pray about everything? Why not? Is it important to you? You're important to God. If it's important to you, you are important to God. So therefore, isn't it important to God? I mean, think about the people you love, the people that you're close to. If it's important to them, guess what it just became? Important to you. It may not be your thing. It may not be your interest. It may not be your hobby. It may not be something otherwise you would be very interested in. But because it's the person that you love and you're in a relationship with, it just became interesting. Because you love them. So when we're thinking about, Lord, am I really need to pray about absolutely everything? I mean, I'm here. you got a lot going on, okay? You're God and you've got a lot going on. But he still wants to hear what you've got going on. So in the Bible, he tells us right here, be anxious for nothing, but in everything... By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Paul calls for us to have peace of mind. If you want peace of mind, give it over to God. If you want peace of mind, let God handle it. If you want peace of mind, be anxious for nothing. 
but pray about it. Invite God into that situation. Bring God in the midst of it. Let God handle it. Let God be in the mix. So number one, I guess, if you want to think about it in terms of this, we got to trust rather than tremble. Now, I just got to be honest with you. I don't want to be in anybody's prison. Anybody's prison. When I was in college, we took a field trip to the Mississippi Delta to a place called Parchman Penitentiary in Sunflower <laughs> County. Horrible. Always here. Oh, yeah, you know, in prison today, everybody's got it made. I don't want to be there. The most ominous sound I ever did hear was when I stepped into that cell. And that James, exactly, he closed that door behind me. An anxiety that I have never felt just to hear the rollers of the steel roll and there was no break in that. And I'm trying to think, how can the guy write shackled up in a dungeon of a prison? Hey, be anxious about that. All things. Pray about everything. Because he was finding peace of mind and peace of his soul by realizing I've got to trust God rather than tremble about what's happening. Anxiety prevents achievement. If we can think about all the things we can do with our mind when our mind is free from fear. When, when your mind is free and you're not burdened and you're not always having things run in the background like we were talking about a moment ago and you can really focus your mind and you can just front sight focus and keep it down range and just think about what you've got to do, how you're going to do it, and you can stay to the task, focus on the task, so much more can get accomplished. But faith and fear are opposites. Faith brings salvation. Faith brings security. Faith brings peace. And a peaceful mind is a powerful mind. Because you can focus. You're not distracted and torn and turned into all of these other things. Faith drives away fear. And it places everything within our reach. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, that powerful, powerful story where Jesus and his two disciples, inner circle, James, John, and Peter, were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. The other disciples had that young boy and that father, and the father, and they, they can't cure him, they can't heal him, they don't have the power. Jesus kind of takes it as a teaching moment to his nine disciples and says, listen, this thing can only be done by prayer and fasting, and you guys haven't been doing that enough. So the teachable moment for them, kind of harsh, kind of, kind of hard on them, but, you know, they need to hear it, they need to learn it. And so then Jesus, you know, he says, tell the dad, and this is my synopsis, hey, what's going on? It's like, son, it's very sick, and all your disciples couldn't do anything. And if you are able, remember that? I love it. And Jesus said, I'm able? With God, all things. And then, you know, that classic line that I love, that speaks to my heart every time. He said, don't you believe? And the dad said, yes, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. I do believe. But I know there's times that my belief falls short. I know there's times my faith's not that strong. And I know there's times that I will get weak. So help me in my unbelief. And then as you may be familiar with the rest of the story, Jesus did heal the boy, and there was rejoicing. All things are possible. Faith is dead to doubt, dumb to discouragement, blind to impossibility, and faith knows nothing but success. 
That is written by a man by the name of Raymond Edmund. I, I want you to hear it again. Faith is dead to doubt, dumb to discouragement, blind to impossibility, and knows nothing but success. Faith doesn't give its way to doubt. Faith doesn't get discouraged. Faith turns a blind eye, so to speak, figuratively, to impossibilities, and it only knows success. So we kind of trust rather than fall into trembling fear. There's a second area that, that plagues our mind and robs us of peace of mind, and that's, I'm just going to say, anger or resentment. Sometimes problems with people. And in those types of situations, we, we've got to practice what the Bible teaches us to forgive rather than to fume. In the Bible, it says in chapter 4 of Ephesians, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So how do we handle bitterness and wrath, anger, and malice? Those are hindrances to the power of God, and they've got to be put away. Anger is a roadblock to accomplishment every time. Amen. I, I referenced a moment ago, 2 Timothy, as Paul was, that is the last letter. He wrote that after he wrote Philippians. And as he was, we were talking about Sunday, as he was writing to Timothy and telling him to come before winter, he longed to see him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the passage that we read Sunday, he t warned Timothy about a, name, a man by the name of Alexander. He said, now, no, that Alexander the coppersmith didn't be much harm. You watch out for him yourself, because he opposes what we teach. So, for Paul to have peace of mind, and to know he had a, well, you know, for Paul to call him out, I guess, like that, he must have truly been an enemy of the gospel. And if he's going to be an enemy of the gospel, he was going to be an enemy to the Apostle Paul, who was spreading the gospel that he was antagonistic against. And so I was trying to think about that. I was thinking, all right, how do you have peace of mind when you know this guy opposes you and has caused you, in your own words, much harm? He had to forgive him. You have to. You have to. Because he also was used by God to write in Ephesians, forgive others. You know, we just read that. It was the same Pauline epistle. Paul wrote that as well, because forgiveness had to happen. So how do we handle that? We consider what anger did to Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 5. Anger filled Cain's heart to the extent that Cain would kill his own brother. He would kill him. Anger robs us of the power to bless other people. Anger stifles Christian fellowship and service. And so forgiveness is the antidote to anger, of being kind one to another, to forgive one another. Forgiveness, then, opens up a channel of power in our lives. Because we really don't have as much power as we want to have. But the power to forgive it is an amazing releasing kind of power. I mean, think about the word itself, for, yeah, for, yeah. I don't really know the etymology of the word or what it actually means, but I think for me, as I've 
pondered a little bit is if to forgive is to give over, to relinquish, release, give up one's right, so to speak, that we think we have to be mad. The wrong that we're holding on to. Now I'm going to give that away. I'm going to release that. I'm not going to hold it. I'm going to let it go. Some of you in the room have children or grandchildren. For whatever reason, you may have watched it yourself. What's that snow thing? Elsa. Elsa, let it go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I first met Mark Davis, <laughs> A long time ago. We were in the interview stage, and I was driving somewhere one night. And anyway, something was said. He just called, you know, Martin would just call you, just to call you. Just to call you. We were in the interview stage. We weren't really, we were close, but we weren't committed, you know. We weren't even, if you want to put it in a dating relationship, we were going out, but we weren't going steady. <laughs> and so <laughs> he called all night, he said, hey, man, Mark Davis. I was like, oh, number popped up on my phone. You know, so he said, what you doing? I said, I'm driving. Where are you going? So he, what what you gonna do there? You know, all this other stuff. Anyway, I, I don't know how this happened or how he worked this in. But somehow something was said in the conversation about letting something go. He sang the entire Let It Go song. <laughs> Me and the I'm like, oh Lord, this guy's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> Don't oh, saddle me with that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I mean, you sang the entire Let It Go song. And, I, and when he finished, I was like, that took a lot of nerve. <laughs> I'm really impressed that you knew it all. And he said, I have a you know, one year old at the time or whatever. I was like, and he said, I hang out with kids. I was like, well, I guess that's why. But you know, the reality is, Forgiving is just that. Let me go. And I know one can say, well, why did, why, why, did, why did Paul say that then about Alexander the accomplishment? Because he loved Timothy. And he knew, Timothy, I don't want you to walk in this blind. That man means harm to the gospel. And when he means harm to the gospel, he means harm to any Christian who will preach the gospel. So be watchful, beware. Alexander the Coppersmith did me much harm, and he will do so unto you, for he opposes what? Paul had to let it go. He had to let that go. Church history tells us, legend and church history tells us, that there were many Roman soldiers put to death by the sword because Paul led them to Christ. To guard the apostle was to hear the gospel. And many soldiers who were guarding the apostle Paul were themselves executed for failure to because the Romans said there was but one Lord, one God, and that is Caesar. And when you proclaim any other God other than Caesar, you are summarily put to death. And they would rather die with Paul in the newfound faith than not. So even these captors, he would treat with that kind of openness and that kind of forgiveness and attitude. So we've got to forgive rather than fume if we're going to have peace of mind. Anger gets in the way of my peace of mind and your peace of mind if we will allow it to. 
Just as fear will get in the way of our peace of mind if we allow it to. And then third, we've got to release things rather than retain things. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Scripture teaches us here, uh, one of our, our favorite verses, or at least one of mine anyway, is 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, casting all your cares or anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, this time, it's not Paul writing this, but it's another instrument of the Lord, the apostle Peter writing this. And he's writing this in the first letter that bears his name, which was to a persecuted church, a church that is going through difficult time in the first century that is being attacked because of their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have anything but peace of mind. And the Lord has given through the Spirit to the Apostle Peter at this time these words, casting all your anxiety or cares on him, meaning Jesus, because he cares for you. Remember earlier when I was talking about the people that you love and the people that bought the things that bothered them all of a sudden just started bothering you? There it is. Because it bothers you, it Because you care about it, he now cares. Because he cares for you. And so these are scriptural reasons to cast our cares on Christ and be free of those cares. But to hold on to those cares makes us weak and weary. Listen, some of us have carried burdens for a long, long time. And can I just tell you, I know you're strong. I know all of those stuff, that, that great qualities and characteristics about people. But we were never, ever equipped or meant to carry those burdens alone. Amen. You are not able to do so. It's too much for you. That's why Jesus said, Come unto me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy. Uh, what's the next part? And my burden is. I want a burden. He wants to take those burdens from you. And this is who the apostle is talking about. That hymn is obviously, you know, it, 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 all of it's capitalized, but a first word, a letter of every word. But that hymn really is, it is capitalized because it's talking about Jesus. And that's what Peter is talking about. Take him your cares. Take him your burdens. Bring him these things and let him have this. For releasing our cares to Christ sets us free. Holding our cares makes us weak and weary. We have the option of releasing our cares because God loves us. Christ died for us. And the cross is proof that God loves us. You know, I got to be, it was after, I don't know where I was. I don't know what happened to me. But I was, I went to church often growing up. But for the goodness life of me, I never remember going to vacation Bible school. Ever. And I don't know if I just blanked out, if I slept through it, if my mama dropped me off, and I said, I have no idea. But I know when I finished seminary and we went to the first church we served, and I hadn't even thought about vacation Bible school. And the sweet ladies of the church said, oh, preacher, we need to get together and have a meeting about vacation Bible school. And I was like, oh, yeah, we do. And they said, how do you, how do you, what do you want to do with Bible school? 
Well, give me your idea. Because I have no idea what I'm doing. And so they tell me everything. I said, hey, sounds good. And so then we get into, you know, the gospel presentation day. Well, I know what I'm going to do. That I got. And it was then, 30-something years ago, that Romans 5, 8 really began to speak. Because I've learned the Romans road of salvation. Romans 3, 23, right? For all of sin, come short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 8 is the next one. Romans 6, 23. Romans 10, 9, 10, 13. That's the Roman road. That's how you can share your faith and lead someone in salvation. But I want us to look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. I want you to show you something. Because sometimes we think, you know, the cross of Christ is so much. And sometimes we think, hey, you know, if we just knew, if, if, I could, if there was just a way I could see and know that God really loves me. Romans 5a shows you God really loves you. Here it is. From the Bible. But God demonstrated his own love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Last Sunday night at Fall Festival, I met with a young person and his family, and I had to share with him the gospel which he tearfully accepted Christ as his Savior. And I have to tell him, Romans 5, 8, ever you wonder if you were really loved, if you were ever wonder, does Christ really care? You go back to Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated. That demonstrate word, it's huge. God said he loves you. I've heard God loves you. But that word demonstrate, he proved it. You with me? He demonstrated his love for you. Love was more than words. Love was action. Again, think about your own human relationship. Somebody says, I love you, 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 love you. Ooh, I love you. But they don't demonstrate that. Their actions don't follow their words. God is that. God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ I didn't say, hey, when you clean up, when you get yourself together, when you act right, do right, walk right, talk right, then we'll talk about me love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died person put it like this. You don't go to the ER when you stop bleeding. You go because you are. You don't come to the Lord when you get right. You come to the Lord to get right. That's the gospel. Because God demonstrated his own love for you. While I was lost in my sin and my shame and my guilt, even when I knew better, I said, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to show you. I'm not just going to tell you. I'm not just going to write it. I'm going to demonstrate love. I'm going to allow my son 
even when he asked me in the garden that night, Daddy, can we do this another way? This is the only way. God demonstrated. The apostle was riding from a prison. And he was sharing with us how to have peace of mind. He's writing to a church in Philippi saying there's power in peace of mind. But to have that peace of mind, you can't have it when you're angry. You can't have it with fear. And you can't have it with all these other things that you're not willing to let go and release. You got to let it go. Cast your cares and your anxieties upon Christ, for he loves you. And remember, he demonstrated that love by going to the cross. In your place. So we ask, do you really love me? Yes, he does. And you prove it. Yeah. Amen. What a great, great testimony of the apostle. We'll look some more into this chapter on the next Wednesday night. But I just wanted to go verse by verse and break it down. Let's bow together. Father, we love you and we thank you that we can have peace of mind when we have the mind of Christ. When we come to you and ask you to take our cares and our concerns, the things that we are worried over, the things that we're anxious about the things that frustrate us. And Father, help us to trust you with those things. To give us the peace of mind that you desire for us to have. Father, we know that Paul was only a person as we are. So may we learn of his great faith in you and placing that faith in you that you would give him peace even in a prison. And so, Father, we can have peace in Christ too. In Jesus' name I pray.